Good afternoon. We'll call the meeting of the Board of Public Utilities for the City of Santa Rosa to order. If we may have a roll call, please. Yes. Uh, Chair Galvin. Here. Vice Chair Anoni. Board Member Badenfort. Here. Board Member Bannister. Here. Board Member Dowd. Here. Board Member Grable. Here. Board Member Mullen. Here. Any statements of abstention by board members? I'll be abstaining from the last minutes. Okay. And any others? All righty. Then we will, we have no study session. The minutes for November 1st, both the special and the regular meeting will be approved and entered. We have a couple of staff briefings. The first one, 5.1 on the agriculture user group update. Deputy Director Kimberly Zanino presenting. Staff will provide an update on the work being performed with the Agricultural User Group. giving you just an update on what is happening with the um, Agricultural Recycled Water User Group and the rates associated with that process. So today we'll be talking about um, key pricing considerations, uh, the work that we have been doing and the discussions that we have been having with the Agricultural Working Group, uh, the working group input that we've received, desired outcomes, um, a possible proposed rate structure, and then the continuing process. So key pricing considerations um, as we started this process and as we move through it, um, we know that we need to maintain agricultural reuse as part of our disposal options. Uh, we know that certainty and predictability has value to both the city and our users. Uh, we also are uh, very aware of that and we've brought to you and talked to you before about the fact that our current pricing and terms are very inconsistent between our over 60 customers. Um, we also um, know that and have um, worked through this process because we know that user input is very vital um, to the sustainability of the program. And then um, we have also heard, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, that implementation of the new uh, pricing or the new rates um, is important to provide uh, our users time to prepare for uh, any sort of rate, especially those that are not paying right now. Uh, so the agricultural user group was developed as we started this process. Um, it, it consists of six of our agricultural recycled water users. Uh, water staff is also involved and then also the Reed group uh, who has worked with us for many, many years and you um, had actually approved uh, a couple months ago uh, an amendment to the contract which included them to be a part of this process. This chart is just giving you a picture of agricultural uh, versus urban reuse. So you can just get a picture of how much water is being used by um, our agricultural users uh, versus the urban users. Um, it really is used for this next slide that we're gonna talk about as well, uh, just really to inform the process that we were going through and the different items that we needed to address during the process. 
Uh, during the process, one of the things that we wanted to determine is really where that volume of water landed that was kind of what we're calling the sweet spot. So where is that predictable amount of reuse for us? And what we could determine by the data from that last chart is that the sweet spot really lands about 4,000 acre feet. Uh, that is a very reliable number of water that we can provide for our agricultural users. Um, 5,000 acre feet is uh, really listed here. We're showing you at about 90% of reliability. So we know somewhere in that range is right about where we can um, get to that predictable amount of water that we can provide. So as we went through the process, uh, we discussed multiple pricing options, um, and this really uh, kind of gives you an idea or a listing of the different things that we were talking to the agricultural users about. We talked about a standard uniform rate um, for the interruptible water supply. Uh, we talked about inclining blocks and declining blocks for tiered pricing to have a two-tiered pricing structure. We talked about fixed allocation pricing and we spent actually quite a bit of time with our users on this um, just because, you know, based on input, they uh, really wanted us to look at those users who were providing more disposal for us or who were our larger users. And so what we did is, is we looked at the possibility of creating a fixed allocation, which would mean our users would come to us, uh, they would uh, give us an allocation that they would like to purchase for the year, uh, and then they would pay a lower price for using that water. The problem with fixed allocation, the downside to it is that you have to commit to using that amount of water, or you have to commit to paying for that amount of water whether you use it or not, and then you would get it at a lower rate. Uh, so we came up with that as an option as well. Um, we also talked about temp temporary urgency disposal incentives, and we'll talk about that a little later in the presentation. And um, we've had some discussion about fixed charges for uh, meters or equipment. Um, and then we also talked about some non-standard rates, which uh, we have not gotten into uh, um, the development of, or we've just really kind of touched on them at this point, uh, being frost protection, off-season storage, and uh, non-interruptible. So the input that we have been receiving from the agricultural users, uh, one is that uh, they are definitely our long-term partners uh, and there has been a period of time where they haven't really felt all that appreciated being those long-term partners for us. So we really wanted to make sure that we started to work on that relationship with them, uh, make sure that you know they knew that how important they were as part of our disposal option, um, that we want to continue those partnerships, that the goal of this process was not to remove that partnership, but to make that partnership better. Uh, we know that uh, regular communication uh, is very important. Um, there are times when we need them to take more water or we are running out of recycled water and keeping those lines of communication open so that they can plan and prepare is very important. And if we aren't doing that, then it can be extremely disruptive to them. They, um, after the discussions about the multiple options for rates, um, it was pretty clear that, that their uh, preference would just be something very simple, uh, a simple rate structure that's easy under, to understand and easy to administer. Um, we know that uh, part of what we'll be looking at, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, is the allotment process that we currently have in place. So that was another concern that they had. Um, and then we know there are some concerns at the end of the season. We're not sure that there's really much that we can do about it, but as the ponds get lower, uh, there is issues with the water, the quality is not as good, and so the lines get um, kind of gunked up and they have some issues with that water when it's being delivered. And then the other thing is uh, the pumps and the meters. So um, we have been discussing the equipment that the city provides and um, it was a big concern for the users that we would try to uh, make them responsible for the pumps and the meters that we've installed. Um, they would not in install pumps or as fancy meters as we have installed for them and we want those on the system for our own uses and so uh, that would not be something moving forward that we would ask them to take on. So, so so it was just a concern that they had expressed to us. 
the desired outcomes of this process uh, was really to have the users be involved um, and have some concurrence on a rate structure, um, not necessarily uh, the actual rate schedule itself, but we were working towards the structure to begin with, um, the development of the rate schedule itself. Uh, we are working towards consistent language in all of the agricultural um, contracts that we have. Um, and then to adopt a policy um, on the recycled water and to bring to you a proposed rate structure in the future um, for your consideration. And then um, we've also talked a little bit with them about trying to do some coordination between the land leases because we have um, yet another layer of complication where we have uh, contracts with ag users, but then we also have ag users that also have leases with us as well. And those, the timing of those two contracts are not consistent at this point. So as we came to um, the last uh, agricultural user group meeting, um, we talked to them about um, having heard their concerns, knowing that they were more interested in just a uniform rate. Uh, we also have heard them uh, many times talk about how a phased implementation would be better for them so that they can prepare for it. Uh, and then also this temporary urgency disposal considerations that we've been um, talking about. So this is what we came to them with um, in the last meeting, a simple to understand, simple to administer rate structure, uh, same for everybody, um, no tiers, no fixed allocations, no um, having to administer how much somebody would like to buy or not buy at the beginning of the year and having to track that. Uh, and so we have talked to them about, this has not gone out to all the users yet, so we'll still be looking for feedback from the rest of the users, but implementing it um, in a phased approach um, as I said before, it's important to our users that they would receive um or they would have the ability to plan in the future um, for what the rate structures are gonna be. So to slowly impl implement up to $50 an acre foot starting in 2020 would be the first year. And the temporary urgency disposal incentives. So um, one of the things we've talked about multiple times is that there are times when we need them to take water and they may not have planned on taking water at that time um, or they we're asking them to take more water um, than they had previously planned. Uh, as an example, when the geysers was down for an extended period this year, uh, that was unexpected. Um, we asked uh, for some of the users to take additional water so that we could um, put a, give a little relief to the storage and so during those times we are proposing that that is a need that we have and so at those times we would not be charging them for anything per acre foot. It would be basically free to them at that time. Uh, and this piece when we talked to them about it, one of the other things that came up is that there are periods of time however they would be pretty rare, um, but there have been times in the past where there's been a need uh, in the winter time when they have already pulled everything off of their fields and they don't really need our water, uh, and we've asked them to take some of it, and so they have to hire people to come out and run lines and do work for them, and so they have asked us to take into consideration times like that when we would ask them and some sort of reimbursement plan in place for when we would ask them to do that outside of irrigation season. For the continuing process, um, our city attorney is now working on um, the beginning of a standard language agreement that would be for all of our users. Uh, we will, as soon as we have that template and that draft in place, we will be bringing that back to the agricultural user group. Uh, we are continuing to work on our communications with our group so that they are aware of how much water we have, uh, when they might be, re right now we were, um, or this last year we were informing them of when they were getting close to their allocations, um, but they, they need a little bit more information like how much storage is left, is there a possibility that we will want them to take more, is there a possibility that there would be more available and so uh, we'll be working on uh, improving those communications and keeping those lines open. We also, as I mentioned before, have been talking about the allocations. Uh, several years ago, uh, we had decided to put an allocation on everybody at 16 inches. Well, some users don't need 16 inches and have never used near 16 inches, and then we have other users who uh, would prefer and would like to get more recycled water than that, and so for um, the next 
probably a couple of months, uh, Bob Reed and I will be working through all of the historical data to try to figure out what a, an actual allocation schedule could look like that would be better for both the customers and for us. We have had discussions about frost protection. Um, Frost protection is not a real disposal option for us. Very little water is used, it's very inconsistent, and it happens at a time of year when we don't really need the, the disposal. So um, we are having discussions about that, although we have not really moved anywhere near making any decisions or even proposing anything there. Um, we want to make sure that when we have those discussions that we bring more people in that are actually users of frost protection. We don't wanna just do that with the group that's volunteered, we wanna make sure that the people affected by it are involved in that process. And then, as I said, we've been discussing the on-site equipment. So the city provides equipment for our agricultural users, um, not all of them, but some of them. Um, so we have discussed the possibility of phasing out um, the uh, maintenance and the provision of that equipment that is on-site. Once again, this does not include, however, the meters or the pumps. Those the city will maintain. Um, those are a benefit to us to really be able to monitor what's being used, where it's being used, when it's being used, uh, and so we will uh, continue to retain the maintenance of those. And then next steps, so the agreement development is one of the next steps. Um, we'll continue to have user meetings. Uh, we will continue to have ad hoc meetings um, following the user meetings um, so that the ad hoc is um, informed on everything that's going on. Uh, and then at some point when we've gotten through uh, most of this work, we will come back to the BPU with a full study session and a recommendation for our rate schedule and the agreements. And with that, I will um, take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Board questions, comments? Board Member Badenfort. Thank you. Um, I am a new member to the ad hoc committee. Um, obviously our relationship and our, our, our business relationship with our ag customers is complex and it's long standing. Um, and incorporates agreements from many, many councils and departments ago, um, but it remains a priority um, that we continue these relationships. My understanding is that this, the development of an ag water rate is one component that will culminate in larger formal contracts with each of our users. Um, but will also include new rules around the responsibility for different infrastructure and equipment on the property. Um, in addition to pumps and meters, um, what other equipment on our user's property has been installed by the city, has been used by the city, um, not only um, just for water delivery, but for our for our kind of emergency disposal needs. So uh, we have we supply they're called K lines to um, some of our ag users and big guns is the other piece of equipment that is common that we are providing for them. So it's the actual equipment that they use to irrigate their properties with. And that's that's it. And so that that's anticipated to transfer. Yes. Responsibility would be to transfer. For those that have it, not, not all of them have it. I think it's a pretty small group actually now that receives um, equipment from us. Um, and of course I, I understand the, the interest in a, uni, in a uniform rate, both uh, administration wise, um, but as we know, all agriculture isn't the same and we're not talking about, you know, 3,700 users, we're talking about 60 or 70 users. Um, and even then, they could be bucketed, right? The, the, the needs and the reality um, and, the very, and the very property of those users uh, are very diverse, but you still could almost bucket it into those with crops and those with pasture and the needs and the level of water disposed, um, very, very different. And so, it, is there any scenario where a non-uniform rate is an option, um, is something that would be appropriate 
for the city and for users to entertain? We are going to, as we send it out to all of the users, see if there's any feedback to go in that direction. Uh, I think it's important to know that the users that are in the group are most of our larger users. Uh, so they're the ones who, um, you know, are going to be taking on most of the burden of the cost. Uh, and, and from that group anyway, they're seeming to be pretty comfortable with the direction that we're going. Uh, but we're definitely, just like I've done with all of the other meetings, um, I send out a communique to all of the agricultural users, so everybody who is a, a participant in our program, they'll get a communique, they'll get information from us, and then I'm requesting feedback from them each time on the next piece. And as far as the contracts go, what, we, what we're doing here really is we're separating out the fee structure from the contracts so that they can have long, well, we don't know how long, but they would like some long-term contracts that are the rules around using the water and then having the fee structure be separate from that. So that's one of the, one of the pieces of the work that we're doing. Um, and then those contracts would also probably have some addendums to them. We, we don't know what those will be yet, but there would be a standard contract about this is, you know, these are the rules, these are the agreements around using the water, but then there may be specific circumstances where we may want to put an addendum in for that. It seems that kind of by, by nature, we're moving from, um, from disposal to a, water as a commodity. Um, I have some questions around the interruptible service, obviously some, um, predictability on their end, right? We have, we have agricultural users that we've had relationships with for decades um, who 40 years ago and 30 years ago and three and a half years ago built businesses around the structure that they have, including how much water they have access to, how much that water costs. And obviously over time, things change. How we value things changes, but it, it's not lost on me that um, the impact to our users is potentially extremely high. Um, for how much gain for the city, I don't know. I'd like to hear um, a bit more around that. And then just a bit more also around if we're shifting from disposal and this kind of uh, collaborative relationship of give and take without an agricultural water rate, how can then we then move to uh, a, a water rate that increases by 100% over three years while also reserving the right to interrupt their service. In the larger context of the city absolutely needing them for redundancy, for emergencies, backup, for what happens if the geysers goes down for four days or four months or four years. I think that there's a much larger context to have this discussion in and I, I, I don't know what the right context is to have it but it's a large conversation that's extremely important and very complicated. I'm not a farmer nor an engineer. So um, I think that there's a lot of questions left. Um, so I think one of the, the biggest shifts that we've had is the fact that, you know, we have had so much regulation come in over the years, over these 40 years where we did use mostly agricultural use and we also were able to discharge, you know, a lot more water and at different times. Uh, really when the geysers project came in, we had never expected for our actual recycled water for the volume to go down or to stay the same. We expected for it to grow. So there was never an expectation that we would have uh, not enough water for both, that we would be able to meet our contractual needs with the geysers, uh, and that we would also be able to meet all the needs of our agricultural users. Um, and unfortunately, that is not the case. The case is that we, um, you know, are not producing more recycled water like we thought we would. Uh, it's not increasing, uh, mostly because of uh, weather has a, an, a piece to, with that, but a lot of that has to do with conservation and the fact that um, our water users are just not using as much water as they used to use, and that doesn't continue to increase. Um, and as more um, building regulations come into place, even with new development, we're not seeing an increase in that use because they're they're um, required to build things that are much more conservative than they were previously. Uh, so it certainly has changed uh, over the years to a factor.
nature of a supply and demand issue as well. Um, and I know that um, at least half of our customers, it's not volumetrically half of what's being used, um, are already paying the $50 an acre foot. And so we were moving towards getting everybody at that same rate, but we didn't want to move them all at once, which is why you see it double, because we wanted to move them slowly and give them time to prepare for that. Uh, so that's why that's why you see it doubling. It's only because we're trying to get everybody to that same price point that we're at currently. So as time as time goes on, um, I mean, I think that uh, what we're at least hearing from the users is that they're comfortable with um, taking on some of the costs. It's not close to the cost to actually provide the service. Uh, it's just a little bit of a relief for uh, the city and for the other ratepayers who are now paying for all of that disposal option. Uh, and then moving forward, uh, you know, we haven't made any discussions about uh, future increases at this point. Um, we have had the request of will there be some sort of uh, inflator that is added to it. We haven't had um, discussions on that really because we really need to take a, a really close look at that and what would be appropriate and what's not appropriate there. Um, but at this point, it's really just to kind of bring everybody to the exact same place as the users that are already paying for it. And if I can add, I'm sorry, I think the consistency across the board and how we're treating our, our recycled water users is really important. So, I mean, this has been a progression and as things have changed and um, new users have come on, we have had those fees in place. And so um, we're looking to try to, you know, make that progress and towards consistency and having a, a, a fair and consistent system in place or structure in place. Um, and I think we're having additional ad hoc meetings, so there still would be um, an opportunity to have further discussions in that setting as well. Um, and I think one, la one other piece to that, the last piece I guess I would add is that, you know, in the past, the other difference is that um, our agricultural users could take a lot more water, but based on our permits and runoff and all the requirements around that, it really has changed uh, the way that we can, we can dispose of the water. Um, in the past, we could just continue to supply and over water, and now we really have to pay attention to that as well and have to be very careful with that. And then my kind of final note is kind of moving forward. I absolutely see the need to um, to evaluate this, um, even to move forward with 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 changes in our rate structure um, and the ability to kind of keep that in and of itself. But I think what I'll continue to be kind of toiling with and 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 looking for answers on is there's this whole other piece. Um, our whole other implications of our ag water users um, that the city would be in great danger without them. Um, the redundancy is crucial for us. Um, and so there's a conversation to be had around what is the value of just them being there and then what is the value of when we do dispose and what's the financial relationship and implications for when we do dispose on that property? How often do we dispose there? How much do we dispose there? How much in fine, discharge fines does it help us avoid? And I think that all of those things as we move forward with a rate that could have dramatic impacts on our users that we consider this entire picture moving forward. So thank you. Board Member Grable. Yeah, thank you for the extensive answers to board member Battenport's questions are very similar to my own. Um, it's been uh, it's been helpful to be in the in the ad hoc meetings and see this process unfold, and see staff respond really well to um, some of our questions and recommendations um, on how how we assess these these rates and the criteria that we use, especially to determine them and what the valuation is of, of the opportunity cost versus the cost. Um, to reiterate some of what Board Member Battenford was saying uh, in terms of the, the big picture, the, the overall sort of whole cost perspective, um, I, I do want to say that it's important to me to have some valuation of, um, you know, because the, I mean, the money we're talking about 
uh, even at 50 acres a foot in 2022 it was, that's what, $220,000 value at 4,500 acre feet, uh, which is the sort of the optimal rate. Um, and then what is probably 30% at least just admin costs and maintaining that. So we're, the net income on that is maybe 150,000 just in that distribution, but then our overall costs are above that obviously, and it's just an offset. So I mean, if, if we're saying it's a $150,000 net, like in our overall budget, it's, if that doesn't seem to me to come anywhere near what the opportunity cost is of not having it. Um, and so one, the, the reason I bring that up again is specifically in relationship to the on-site equipment, it does seem to me that having the option, if it's only say five users, which I think it is that are using equipment like K-Lions and big guns, it, it might behoove us to continue to provide that if it's, I think the cost of just those was maybe 70,000, I think, all of them. Um, it might behoove us to make sure that those are there if we need them, because otherwise, from talking to the users and going out in the field on their properties, it seems to me that um, if the K-lines aren't in place and there is a contingency where we need them to, uh, to discharge for us, um, it's a lot of times it's cheaper for them to just feed with grain and not graze. Um, and, and I think it gets into a larger conversation with that about, you know, obviously the opportunity, not just the opportunity cost of not, of not having uh, the ag user, but also um, grazing in general, groundwater recharge, the GSA coming down, what, what's the cost benefit for those users of not putting the straw on the ground and just pumping out, which I think is more costly to them, but more predictable. And obviously it's a private property right combined with GSA rate structure, which isn't established yet. But it, that seems to me to be something that we can at least start to hone in on some values as, as board member Badenport said, um, because we're talking about such a small amount of money net to us from it, it's much more about like the whole system's valuation. Like what, you know, what is that offset worth? What is the contingency worth if the geysers goes down? Um, and then also in our negotiations with the North Coast Regional Water Board, there seems to be a value to that in the way that I think we are at least, um, you know, negotiating with them about about the whole nutrient offset program, right? Like that's that is also coming up, and it will come up again. And, and I think there might even be a um, a way to evaluate and monetize that, you know, offset of of, of having that contingency. I'm not even in a force majeure, not discharging because say the geyser goes down in an earthquake, it's a force majeure, but there's still a value to not discharging into the Russian River watershed in a force majeure. And if we have that capacity, why not use that? And maybe there's a grant from the North Coast Regional Water Board that can offset that. It just seems to me there's a, that's the big picture perspective in terms of honing down on those values and, and opportunity costs and contingencies. Um, the second thing I would just say is the, the timeline of this, uh, I know we're, it's gonna come back to the ad hoc, but I would like to have uh, a good timeline on the um, sort of the, at, at some future meeting in the, in the near future, a timeline on, on not on the, the implementation, but mm -hmm. on the, uh, the contract finalization and, and like really knowing that we've done our due diligence with listening to the user group and looking at our operations and our staff and our overall budget and our projections for the next you know, 10 years, 20 years on this stuff. Um, seeing a just any kind of potential timeline that would help me just in terms of like how quickly we need to have these conversations and, and, and make sure that we're getting the feedback that we, that we need. Uh, the third thing I would say is just as that implementation phase comes, uh, for the rate structure? Yes, as the implementation, uh, you know, if that's the proposed implementation phase, um, the way that we write these contracts, I would say, for these rates should have, uh, and maybe this is, this is already happening and, and it's news to me, um, but 
having some flexibility in there in coordination with the GSA stuff, which has a similar timeline of implementation by 2023, right? That's the, the deadline, I think, for the GSA, or the GSP, sorry. 2022. 2022. So it, it coordinates pretty well with that. Now, if just having some coordination there so that we know is there a criteria in that for recharge above use, in which case we're actually feeding into recharge above use if we are discharging on a grazing property, which has the highest rate of recharge over pasture land, right, compared to other urban uses or whatever. Um, just seems to me the biggest, yeah, the biggest coordination piece there would be with the GSP. Um, and that's it's probably already happening, but I just wanted to make sure that, that there was some flexibility written into the contracts themselves to allow for that, depending on what gets decided, because it's kind of siloed right now, obviously, in a different JPA, so. I think we're really hoping that there's going to be movement towards and more indication of where that's going as far as fees go as well as this moves forward. Um, we kind of have a lot of things going on at the same time and we don't know what those are going to be yet, but we are watching that very closely to try to see where that lands. Because we don't want to be yeah. more ever than it would cost to pay fees to go through groundwater right. use. So. And, and because we don't know those things, all I'm saying is having the flexibility maybe written into the contract as a contingency for, you know, if the GSA, the GSP is this or this or that, you know, those rates, obviously we, we would not want to incentivize, you know, only groundwater use when we have this resource available, so. But thank you. Board Member Dowd. Uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Deputy Director, as you know. Um, as I look through this presentation, the first thing that caught my attention, because it was my understanding that we, the chairman had set up a subcommittee at ag uh, reuse, and when I got to chart number four, uh, I was concerned that no member of that subcommittee was involved in some of these discussions to gather information. And when I, when I think about the fundamental needs of our system and the integrity of our system, uh, egg plays a very important part in how we balance the water that we uh, collect and treat and then dispose. So, uh, later in the presentation then, it so said that you were gonna have additional meetings uh, with the ad hoc subcommittee. I believe the two members who have spoken already are both on that committee. I don't know if there's anyone else or not. Um, but it's really important, in my opinion, that that subcommittee weigh in on some of these issues um, as soon as possible if, if you've gathered enough information because this reaches into, which I think I've heard both of our other, my colleagues say, uh, it, it reaches into the MPDES permits. It, it's, it's a full package. So uh, I certainly want to see the subcommittee actively engaged in it and then bringing their recommendations that are developed with staff and, and any consultants like the Reed Group that you're using uh, to bring a recommendation to the board. So uh, what we have been doing is we've been scheduling an ad hoc meeting uh, after a user meeting. And then we invite the users to come to the ad hoc meeting so they have the opportunity to uh, give comment and discuss with the ad hoc committee. So that they have, not only do we have the time where we're spending with the user group themselves, but then we invite the user group to come to ad hoc so that they can have discussion at those meetings as well. And, and I'm, as I'm sure you're well aware, Deputy Director, so you know, because of all the things that you process through, it's very important, in my opinion, that we continue to use the process that we've had here for years and years and years and years, which is have members of the BPU engaged in the creation of the recommendations that come to the BPU so the BPU can recommend to the city council over issues as important as this is to the whole system. So that's my point. And if it's moving along in that direction, uh, it wasn't readily uh, obvious to me as I looked at this. Yeah, that will be the plan is to go to the ad hoc first. The ad hoc would make a recommendation then to the full board. 
Thank you. And just so you're clear, uh, Board Member Dowd, uh, Vice Chair Arnone is also on that ad hoc committee. I thought that was the case, but not quite. Board Member Mullen. Uh, thank you. Um, it's, it's clear to me, uh, listening to the presentation and reading some of the background materials, that um, we're, we're heading in a, in a different direction. Our, our private partner, pr public private partnership that has gone on for decades with the ag users is now moving into a, a new sort of an era. And as it's some of the other uh, board members have stated, it's, it's now moving into the commodity side of this, where before we in essence begged them to take it and they took it. And so there should be some reward, I believe, in, in as we move into the next chapter to reward those longtime users um, for that reliability that they provided to us during a time when we absolutely had to have it. Um, however, at, at the same time, we, um, it, it's, it's also no secret that Reuse, water reuse is the most expensive disposal option of any of the others that we that we use because of all the costs associated with power, pipes, and man, manpower and so forth. Um, and so in this public-private partnership and the discussions, and, and I know Bob Reed and staff have developed relationships and, and done this before in other jurisdictions, but to everybody move towards the center point where everybody feels like they can live with that. And it's fair to both sides. Um, one thing that I would appreciate seeing when the rates come back, uh, if I'm still sitting at this table, um, that the cost recovery that we try to achieve with the, whatever rate structure comes forward, that we show so that the the ratepayers and everybody that is interested in this can see how much we're actually recovering through whatever rates we settle in on compared to what our cost is to provide. Uh, I think that's gonna be a very telling number because it will see that we're clearly not recovering anything close to our total cost, but we're recovering something. And I know how hard it is with some of these users to go from zero to something. Um, and so I would hope that we bring forward something in that kind of, uh, kind of vein. Um, with respect to the, the, the piping and whatever other facilities are beyond the meter on the user's property, um, if we're moving towards a commodity, I would, as one person, would like to see us moving into a situation like we are on the freshwater side where our obligation ends at the meter. Um, and if there are facilities on the property that have historically been provided by the city to certain users, uh, I have no problem letting that equipment go through its useful life. But when, when that useful life is over, then the obligation for maintenance and purchase and replacement repair becomes the obligation of the users so that we then, our obligation ends at the meter. If something goes wrong with the equipment that we have provided on the user's property, we're not on the hook for any kind of damages because of erosion, because of whatever could, could result from damage to that equipment that we provide. So I, for one, would support ending our obligation at the meter and letting whatever is out there now continue at its useful life. Um, and when it ends, then it becomes the obligation of the user. Um, do long term do we see these rates and this this process of dealing with this commodity to add users down the, down the line if say for instance if somebody came to staff tomorrow and said i have a 100 acre vineyard and i don't have a water supply and i'm right down the street from your pipeline can i get some water w would we entertain that so currently we have a waiting list okay. because we just don't have the supply to add any additional users. Okay. Uh, as people uh, leave properties, um, the new users come along and typically if they've already had recycled water, then they also take on recycled water because a lot of the users now, you know, have not, they don't have active wells on their properties because they've been using the recycled water. So we do have people who are interested and we actually have a waiting list for um, other recycled users right now. So knowing that and that there are people waiting for the water, it, it perhaps again as a way to kind of reward our existing users is 
Anybody that's in, in the door by whatever date these new rates are adopted gets the tier rate, whatever the tiering is. But new users come in, you're up here at whatever rate we're trying to get to um, versus the, the people that have been with us all the way along, you get to phase in so that the new users then come in because they have a need. The, the, water, the fresh water supply in this basin is getting tighter all the time and water rights are starting to shake out and enforcement actions are, so we may see more and more people coming forward um, and I, I think those people should be treated differently than the longtime users, uh, that there should be a, a, a rate up here, this is the rate, and everybody else is kind of phasing up to that over whatever number of years uh, ultimately gets decided on. Um, my, my last question is related to the urban users. So do we have, um, a rate or are, are urban users, do they pay a rate now or do they get it free? No, our urban users actually pay quite a bit. It's 95%? 95% of the potable rate. Okay, okay. Um, just see my notes here. Oh, last question, and I think this is for uh, our attorney. The fact that the, whatever rate we adopt for these users, uh, it's a rate for willing users that come in voluntarily and want to sign these agreements that say, this is how we'll do it and this is the rate we're going to adopt. Are we outside of a Prop 218 situation on it, uh, amending or adopting these rates? Yes, we are outside of the Prop 218 because it's um, not considered a property-based benefit. It's um, interruptible service and it's something that people are not, um, there's no, Essential, it's not essential that they have the water as it is in a, a urban, commercial, or residential use. Uh, my last question is, when we come forward, will we have a, um, will some of the information um, include comparisons to other ag rates? Uh, we have some of those now. Uh, other ag rates that have been developed are, are pretty high. Um, some of those are communities that don't have a disposal need, so there is it's just a commodity for them. Um, others have worked with those agricultural users who have said we'll pay more if we can get the water. So they've they've developed rates there. Um, so we do have some that we can show you in the future. Again, just so that we can show the public ratepayers yep. and everyone here's how these proposals those rates would compare to other jurisdictions that are in place now. So yeah, the ones Thank that you. we can find are between 150 and about $800 an acre foot. Wow. Thank you. Board Member Grable. Yeah, I would just say that when we when we looked at uh, rate comparisons, it was not terribly useful just because our system is so unique in that the geysers contractual obligations and. As far as I know, there isn't another water department that has that type of system, at least in the United States. I'm, I'm not sure if that. I think I think Windsor is the closest to us because they actually dispose through the geysers as well, and they have right. a disposal need. So they're probably the closest to us, but it's they're not as large as us, so we don't have you know they don't they don't have the same need that we do. Board Member Bannister. Thank you. Um, I can certainly see the need to rationalize the system and, and uh, bring some uniformity to it, so I think this is great. I'm curious, the, the rate, the target rate of $50, um, where did that come from? That basically is the rate that was developed for the customers that were coming on who were not either getting the water for free or being paid for it. Uh, and so we decided just to move towards that consistent rate of $50. It is um, less than the electrical costs even for for per acre foot for it. Um, but we still, as we as we you know keep discussing, it's not just about us recovering costs. It's also about our disposal need and wanting to make sure that we don't um, certainly outprice our ag users. We want them to be, um, you know, have the incentive also to use the water because it's for at least the least expensive option for them. So they, I mean, so it was a negotiated rate in some ways and, and they are, uh, 
supportive of, of that uh, ultimate rate? Some of the users, yeah, that are on the user group anyway are already paying that. They're already paying the $50 uh, an acre foot. It's the very long term, and some of those are customers that actually were long term and then they signed new contracts with us. And so uh, really what kind of facilit us, facilitated us moving towards this is that we have a lot of those long term contracts that are coming up and they're expiring. Uh, and they should all be expired, I believe, that 2027, is that what it is? Oh, I'm not sure of the last I'm not even date. Sure I know that, that those that were set to expire at the end of this year were simply extending for an additional year, and I'm not sure how many would still have um, an additional term beyond that on their own. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look up that information. But yeah, this was the time when all of those contracts were starting to term out. Uh, and so this was the time that, that we really decided to take a look at, at, at the consistency between them. Thank you. Board Member Battenfort. Thank you. Um, circling back, actually, you mentioned um, consideration of some changes to the frost protection um, process that we have now. Um, Obviously, these are kind of long-term businesses where stability is is king. Um, are there decisions that are being considered at the staff level at this time that will come before either the ad hoc group or BPU as a whole? Um, and what's the timeline on that? We haven't made any decisions about frost protection. We've just started to actually have those discussions. Uh, and so when we had the discussion with the agricultural user group, we actually have a couple of customers there that use the frost protection. Uh, and their, um, their thoughts are that uh, if we decide to move towards actually just not even providing frost protection, that we would need to give them much time to plan for that because there are other, there are other ways to provide frost protection outside of water, um, but it would take them time to plan and implement anything. Um, one of the other discussions that has gone on is if they have storage on site, then they can just take the recycled water, store the recycled water, and then use it for frost protection when they need it instead of us having to um, go through the process of middle of the night emergency situation, going out, making sure that things are working properly um, on a pretty rare basis. And I know that we, um we, we have some public-private partnerships around storage on some, some other property. Are we, do we actively work with the RCDs or with farm bureaus or with any of the ag entities or even individuals um, on developing more capacity, uh, more ponds on, on more properties? That one I would not know. Maybe Joe, would you know? Uh, I'd have to check in uh, and see. I, I mean, in the past, we've looked for more opportunities for storage. Um, when we were looking at the geysers, that was our entire plan, was to try to find storage somewhere else and, and use reuse that water. But um, unfortunately, there were too many um, issues that came up around that, just based on our area with tiger salamander and other endangered uh, plant life. Uh, so I know that was a complication before. I don't think that we have been, but I would need to check into that, whether or not we've actually looked to anybody else to try and get any more storage capacity. Thanks. Yeah, actually, I had one more comment that I forgot to address on the the lease, the, the land lease for ag users. Um, it's my understanding that before we leased some of our farmlands to ag users that the land management was not going so well. Um, and I'd like to learn a little bit more about that in terms of the, the fallow, you know, what was going on and how it was characterized um, before we leased that land. Um, but I appreciated that bullet point about coordinating specifically on the land management side because we do own that property. Like you said, we are liable for a lot of other things that go on on that property, including the, the tiger salamander stuff, which we've incurred liabilities for in the past. Um, it, it does seem to behoove us to, uh, to have ex, you know, very accessible and coordinated rates on our lands that also corresponds to other, I would say, pasture lands in the Laguna and, and the Santa Rosa Plains specifically because we have those sensitive species, but also just long term, we're starting to recognize the value of pasture land for recharge, for climate and carbon sequestration. Um, 
for wildlife it, it, and biodiversity. It does those corridors, um, having them be effective, you know, uh, genetic corridors, for instance, for all of that biodiversity. It seems to have a significant value uh, when you talk to the scientists like, you know, Lisa McKaylee at Pepperwood or um, some of the folks at Sonoma State focusing on CTS. That, that to me, it was just another thing that I really wanted to hone in on some sort of a, a future valuation showing that there is value. It's not a gift of public funds. It's not a, you know, it's not just something we're doing because we've always done it. There's there's actually science to back up the fact that this is a, it's a public resource. It is a insurance policy for climate, for availability of groundwater and drinking water and, and biodiversity and, and wildlife, which has all kinds of other, you know, positive externalities. So it's something that I know the metrics are not there for yet, but globally they, they're they getting there. Um, so it'd be something to include um, in our maybe explanation to the public, but also in our kind of future plans for, you know, what we, what we value in terms of land management and um, priority. Any other board member questions or comments? Well, I would echo um, most, if not all, of the comments that the fellow board members have made. Uh, Ms. Zanino, I think it's been critical, the amount of work that uh, staff has done, and I really want to commend staff and the three members of the ad hoc committee. And I know that um, they'll be working hard along with the, the city attorney's office to get that agreement in a condition where we can review it and hopefully approve it and move forward with that and the uh, setting of the rates. So thank you for the presentation and we'll look forward to uh, future updates. Thank you. Item 5.2 is a staff briefing on the producer responsibility legislation for unused medicines and sharps. Mr. St. George, welcome. We need to get your microphone working better. Martin St. George? Yeah, there we go, thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, Martin St. George with the Environmental uh, Services Division. I'm in the Environmental Compliance Section. And we're going to be on the other end of the spectrum of Mrs. Zaninu's talk about recycled water. We're the group that helps protect the water that goes into the uh, publicly owned treatment works. So what am I going to talk about? S Senate Bill 212 and what it means for Santa Rosa and the whole regional system as well as the county. Um, what is Senate Bill 212? It's the Pharmaceutical Drugs and Sharps Take Back Program. Um, it's an extended producer responsibility legislation. Um, it's the first in California and includes pharmaceuticals and sharps. Um, and we see here Governor Brown signing it. On the uh, right of the screen, we've got Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, and she was the one that brought it forward and has been a champion for the cause, along with uh, many stakeholders, which include the collaborative of our safe, safe medicine disposal program that we have right now in the regional system. Um, so the implement implementation timeline for the Senate bill. Uh, the California Department of Resources and Recycling and Recovery, or Cal Recycle as we know them as, um, will be overseeing the implementation of the program. It's approximately a three and a half year implementation process. Um, they've got until, Cal Recycle has until January 2021 to promulgate the program and um, get it set up in the state administration. Um, July 1st, 2021, or approximately six months, the stewardship plans have to be submitted by the manufacturers of the Sharps and the pharmaceuticals. And um, we've got October 1st, 90 days for approval of those stewardship plans, and then there's, to be fully implemented, it's another 270 days. So it's roughly three and a half years, and um, the first couple years, there'll be no support from, from uh, the manufacturers and 
taking back any uh, sharps or medicine, so we're gonna have to uh, address that and we'll see that in some consecutive slides. The enforcement of the, of the uh, program will be by Cal Recycle. They'll be overseeing the enforcement and they do have penalties and fines up to $5,000 for incidences to help make sure it happens. Um, the key provisions for the manufacturers and the manufacturers may participate as individuals or as a group or through stewardship organizations as it's set up now in many of the other counties that had already adopted ordinances for their county, it's predominantly run by stewardship organizations. So we anticipate that's what's gonna happen statewide. Um, the manufacturers of sharps and medicines will be paying for the programs and they are also responsible for uh, the promotion and the education um, for consumers to participate in these take back programs. Uh, the convenience standards, this is something as we came forward to discuss with BPU and council throughout the years is these convenience standards um, are landing on 50, a bin every 50,000 people. Um, it is possible to have more than that if during this interim time period, we advertise the program and, and get more pharmacies involved now, which they can do voluntarily if they choose to. And we had some very good sites um, locally that were strong participants in this program in the past, which we're hoping they'll come back in. And I'll explain a little bit later why they dropped out. Um, who qualifies for this? Any retail pharmacy, hospital, clinic with an on-site pharmacy or a law enforcement agency will qualify for this program. Uh, individuals who don't have the ability to get to a site can also have mailbacks for their medicine um, for their, so they can request a package and they'll get sent a prepaid uh, package to their home. And this also applies to uh, caregivers. They can also order them for somebody who may not be able to do it for themselves. So they're really trying to include everybody they can in this. Uh, convenience standards for sharps, is, are, they're a little different. They don't have the kiosks or the drop-off spots like we do with the safe medicine, but they will, it will be all mail back and mail back containers, which they will be uh, given when they purchase their sharps. Um, and the other nice caveat on this is the, the SB 212 will mandate producers of needles to reimburse the local governments for any needles they collect and dispose of. Uh, the local agency collaborative um, back in 2007, um, you know, Chairman Galvin and uh, board member Dowd and Deputy Director Burke and myself and others were all here when we first started down this path. And it's been, it's been a ways coming and, you know, we get to see how government works together, how collaborative groups work together. Well, this original collaborative, this Santa Rosa and the regional system with Katati, Roner Park and Sebastopol, as well as the Sonoma County Water Agency, Russian River Watershed Association, Sonoma County Waste Management Association and the Sonoma County Department of Health. Um, I call them all out because this, this group is just a small representation of what was happening all over the country. I mean, we have wastewater concerns, we had water reuse concerns, we had sharps concerns, we had um, medicine abuse concerns, and um, you know all issues that we see in the headlines rarely now, and and things that we're dealing with significantly here in this in the regional system and the city of Santa Rosa. So um, it was uh, it's it's a day to celebrate for many of us that were that started off that process then, and to where we are now, and uh, it's very exciting to see this come to fruition. Um, our next steps, um, as a collaborative, we will continue to operate our own agency's medicine disposal programs, um, and we will continue to fund those. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm spending 20,000, less than $20,000 a year on the program to keep them going, and uh, we anticipate maybe a, a slight increase in costs if we get some more sites back in, but right now, this is, this is where we stand. Uh, the collaborative as a whole will continue to pursue grant opportunities because there have been some grant opportunities uh, advertised and promulgated to uh, as stopgap funding for some of the uh, municipalities or agencies that, that don't have the funds to keep it going, um, who weren't uh, planning on this 
such a long interim period. Uh, also, we will continue to perform pharmacy outreach to increase the sites, as well as uh, conduct public awareness campaigns or marketing, if you will. Um, right now, we have about four police stations in the sub-regional regional system that we're uh, taking back out. I wanted to share, this, these are county disposal totals, but they do parallel what has happened in the city of Santa Rosa as well and the regional system. Um, the, the bar chart are the volumes that have been taken back by year and the, uh, the line graph um, are the number of sites. And you can see where the, the line graph um, and the bar charts peaked out in 2015. Well, 2015 is when the DEA had some very stringent regulations that they implemented, which uh, really controlled what could be a site and controlled how you could move the, uh, the waste medications that were taken back. So after that, we saw a decline. And then there was another decline after 2017, a uh, fairly sharp decline, and that was after the Board of Pharmacy made it much more stringent for pharmacies to place these kiosks and have oversight over the kiosks inside their facilities. And many pharmacies dropped out at that point. A lot of our local independent pharmacies dropped out at that point, frustrated with the regulations. Um, at this point, though, we are we're pleased that uh, moving forward, we're going to see um, these numbers grow again. We're going to see sites and or convenience standards, as we're calling them now, um, increase, and uh, we're we're pleased that we're able to continue on with this process. And uh, I just again like to thank the board for hearing me today and letting us participate in this this program, and uh, to see how, to anticipate the success that it's going to have in many different areas, um, not just in our own city, but across the nation eventually. And it's it's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. St. George. Any board member questions or comments? Board member Bannister. So that last graph is is interesting because it obviously demonstrates the uh, correlation between number of sites and how much is actually brought into those sites in tonnage. Um, and, and then earlier in the presentation, there was a mention of a bin for, per 50,000 people. But are the bins different than the actual collection kiosks dis, uh, or whatever that are at the pharmacies? I don't, I don't follow that. The bins and the kiosks are somewhat interchangeably used when dialoguing about um, the the safe medicine disposal site. So you would have a bin or a kiosk. It, the bins started to began to be called kiosk somewhere along the way in the process. And because it's a little more uh, sophisticated than just a bin, there's a double lock system on it. There's a certain amount of placarding that's uh, required by law to state what's acceptable, what's not acceptable uh, in the bins. Um, they have to be able to be uh, locked out entirely if the bins are not over um, being able to be observed during hours. So if they were placed by a pharmacy and you're counting on a pharmacy technician to watch that, that bin and they close the pharmacy, well, they want to be able to lock them so nobody can tamper with them. And, and to get into the bins um, to remove an overall uh, a secondary uh, container inside, you have to have a double key system that a hauler has one key and a pharmacist or a technician in a pharmacy has another key as a safety precaution so that um, there'll be no diversion. And that's, you know, that was always the, the DEA's concern of this whole thing was diversion. Um, so their kiosk and bin is interchangeable. virtually interchangeable. Okay. so. In 2015, when we had 38 disposal sites, we collected nearly 20,000 pounds of safely uh, disposal, and that's gone down now to something like 5,000 pounds because we've lost a lot of sites. That's that's the, that's what you see when you have a drop off in convenience. Yes, but the can, the the number of one site that bin per 50,000 would imply that we're going to continue to reduce the number of sites or is that that's a minimum? 
And there's also the mailback program that is also part of the convenience standard. So you can request those mailback um, packages, which will increase the convenience standard. Um, there are some reg some other regulations, like 15% of any company's uh, pharmacies have to, you have to have at least 15% of your pharmacies participating in an area. Um, some pharmacies, which I'm not gonna call out, already have um, systems in place with mailback. So in a, in a sense, we're already ahead of our convenience standard, but it's gonna take a while for these totals to um, be realized um, as increasing. Incre and I mean realized as being increased numbers. Um, but the convenience standards will be, will be higher than the 50,000 as it, as it plays out. But it, that's just what was written initially and how that gets allocated. Uh, the collaborative um, will work with Cal Recycle to get representation in an area because there are some concerns from different um, board of supervisor members and, and, and other uh, collaborative members about wanting representation in their areas and um, will we have more representation in areas where there will be high usage and that sort of thing where the population demographics um, you know, like a Walgreens out on Highway 12 in Mission. That that was that's a very good site for taking it back. Over the years, we had a lot return there, and I'm, I have to believe part of that has to do with Oakmont using that site. So you know, things like that. There, it's in strategic placement is important, um, and that's part of the reason why, as a collaborative, we want to market and reach out to pharmacies or other uh, potential sites to get them involved now, because once they're in, they're in now, then they're grandfathered in when um, Cal Recycle adopts and everything's fully uh, processed through. I would just hope that we can maximize those number of collection sites so that we can maximize the uh, collections. Thank you. Board Member Grable. Yeah, I'd like to tag on to that. Uh, not only would we benefit in the water benefit, obviously, from more collection sites, but as we know, the you know the rate of opiate use is, is as far as I know, going up in, in Sonoma County. Um, and as a preventative measure, and also because I think there's a lot of funding available for this um, through, um, through programs that are specifically designed to, to combat opiate, um, opiate use and, and opiate addiction. Um, it does seem to me that, you know, in a case where someone obviously needs to be prescribed Oxycontin or some other opiate painkiller, pain which for some people works a lot better than others, and, and I understand pain management is really important in this day and age, especially for an aging population. The, it seems to me that the, the marketing side in terms of the, having having the funding for a really effective public information campaign uh, would be almost as important as having more sites of collection where if you're just looking at that rapid decline based on number of bins or uh, uh, disposal sites that you're talking about, um, if that co corresponds in that way, to me, it, the first thing I think about is, well, then doesn't that increase the likelihood that someone will have access for the first time to, for instance, Oxycontin or something, because it just happened to be still at their grandma's house or their parents' house or whatever it is, because there wasn't necessarily a, a really effective public information campaign of saying, not only are these places available for this disposal, but you need to do this for the health of our community and for our kids, and you know, it it does seem to me to be an imperative on that on that end, specifically related to those problems. When, I mean, I'm sure you're much more aware of the, the data and the metrics and how those things relate. But it seems to me that if there's a correlation there, it's a huge preventative preventative opportunity for that as well. But has to come with a significant public information campaign that I know is very expensive. So you know, maybe combining uh, with, with the grant money that I know is available for those, for those programs. Um, just, just a thought, and maybe you can give some feedback on how that relates. Well, that's one of the, the nice things about having um, the uh, 
County Health um, involved with us is they have a, um, you know, they have a, a, a steady line to a lot of those grant opportunities and they are applying to them and they're helping us um, from that end. <clears throat> and also we are, you know, some of the drop off too was our, we weren't doing as much marketing because we weren't sure about the state of the program. We weren't sure what it was gonna look like. As you, you know, the county ordinance was moving along to potentially have a county uh, safe mes medicine disposal program. And it was basically a month away from the first read and we were potentially two to two and a half months away from being adopted. But because we saw SB 212 was being so successful, the Board of Supervisors said, hey, let's, let's just wait and see what SB 212 happens because they're gonna be voting on it. Uh, when we're, we potentially would be doing the first read, let's let's put it off a month, and, and this is what we end up with, SB 212 passed. And back over the last couple of years of the program, there were other uncertainties to do with the hauling and, and to do with the Board of Pharmacy and the DEA's office, and uh, pharmacies were not sure where they wanted to position themselves. So we were having a hard time advertising sites that we weren't sure if they were gonna be in or not. Now that we have terra firma, we can start building on something and with the pharmacies, with Cal Recycle, with our collaborative group and you know have very set sites that we can market and feel comfortable with marketing around them. Whereas before it was too variable. We, we wanted to be strategic with those limited dollars. And we have found what marketing works in the past. I mean, we had very successful bus ad campaigns, movie theater campaigns, that, you know, the bus ads on the outside and the inside, very inexpensive, but reaches a lot of people locally, um, good campaigns. And we have others like that. And we will, um, we are dusting them off and getting them ready to go again. That was something we discussed actually uh, earlier this week in our collaborative group. We had a meeting earlier and that's, we were discussing where we're going with marketing. Does the bill provide for a floor or a ceiling for the manufacturers to contribute a certain amount or percentage towards the promotion and the education of these programs? You know, I don't have those numbers readily at hand. They are responsible for promotion and they are responsible for total collection. But as far as the ceiling, I, I can't tell you at this point. But there is some measure that they have to live up to in order to- There are metrics included in the, in the bill. You. Board Member Dowd. Uh, thank you. I'm very, very much in favor of getting these, call them medical products, sharps and, and various drugs out of being just thrown away. But I find it interesting that the group that you see, that you state in your presentation, Cal Recycle, oversees a lot of this, and yet your chart says county disposal totals. So disposal and recycle are not the same thing, and I really wonder, uh, especially after watching this week's uh, upheaval of the whole recycle market because China has shut down receiving various things. Um, I, how is all that gonna impact and what does this really look like? What happens to this stuff that gets put in the bins and kiosks? Uh, does it just go into the landfill anyway? What, what's going on with it? They will continue to be uh, incinerated. The, the the medicines, the leftover medicines, unused prescriptions and whatnot that are turned in, they they are in, go to incinerators, and that'll be the fate. Um, you know, I, I'm not as versed in the sharps so I don't wanna venture that as far. There's, the County Department of Health has mentioned two ways of disposing of them. One is to also incinerate them. It's a different incineration point. And then the other one is they can be autoclaved and put to landfills, but the problem with that is if you get them at a local landfill and the container breaks open, nobody knows if it's an autoclaved sharp or an unautoclaved sharp, and it can create um, issues. So they're trying to avoid any kind of local landfill 
landfill. Um, there's a hope that um, there will be designated landfills, so there it'll be a cheaper uh, disposal cost associated with the sharps if they can line that up. Not all the moving parts are, are in place yet, and that's one of the reasons for the two-year uh, period for Cal Recycle to get the program promulgated. Yeah, I'll just point out that some of those questions will likely be answered in the promulgation of regulations that's going to take place. Any other board member? Yes, uh, board member Mullen. Thank you. Um, it's, it's pretty shocking to see the um, the drop off in collection sites and collection pounds um, in the last few years. It, it sort of explains the dilemma, the personal dilemma I had a couple of years ago uh, when my sister passed away. Um, she had a bunch of old medication that I volunteered to dispose of, not knowing that it was half a Safeway bag full of stuff. And I drove all over a, a, a city in Marin County um, and called people asking where I could dispose of this stuff safely. Um, and none of them had the capability to, to take it except the police department. And as I walked in there with my Safeway bag, I'm imagining if I'm perhaps somebody else and there's a camera in there and here I come walking in with this Safeway bag full of stuff and dump it in that bin where it's securely taken care of, that some people may be reluctant to do that um, just for that environment. Um, but it, it's, to see the drop off, it's, it's pretty compelling um, why it's so hard to get rid of this stuff now. Um, and so it's encouraging, on the other hand, that um, the legislation now is going to help start this back up and make it perhaps even more effective. But um, looking at the stakeholders that you had here on um, the, the collaborative, um, I notice a couple of areas or stakeholders missing. Um, the, the cities, um, I, I realize they're members of the Waste Management Agency and some are, are contractors with the Water Agency and some are part of the sub-regional system that Santa Rosa operates, but not all of them. Some of them operate their own wastewater systems and so forth. Um, and so I, I don't see all the cities represented there. And of course they have a stake in that because they're dealing with the same issues we all are. So it'd be interesting to see how we bring all the cities into that. And at, in the same way, um, the solid waste haulers have an obligation to participate in recycling um, yes. in accordance with their franchises. Um, and they're just as concerned with what goes in those bins as we are with what goes down the toilet. Um, and so I don't see them listed um, anywhere in there in this collaborative, and it'd be uh, interesting to see why uh, and how to bring them into the, uh, uh, under the tent, so to speak, including Republic, who runs the landfill uh, for the county, and they are dealing with whatever comes through there. Now, there is that, that hazardous waste facility down there, um, but I'm sure some stuff sneaks through that people put out in their in their bins that perhaps shouldn't. So um, with adding some of these other areas to the collaborative, it would seem that it uh, for grant opportunities that would make us a stronger candidate because we've done outreach to every stakeholder in the county um, from Cloverdale down to Petaluma and brought them into the tent so that we can do collaboration with programs, with monitoring, with reporting, with information sharing, programs that work, programs that don't work, and you get a universal message all the way across the county, whether you're in Katati or you're up in Cloverdale. Um, so it would, uh, I, I would encourage us to, uh, the staff in this collaborative that's been formed and operating for the last uh, decade or so, that we try to cast a wider net and get some of these other stakeholders that I think have real purpose and more importantly uh, are, have obligations to deal with some of this and can perhaps do some more cost sharing um, for all of us, which benefits everyone. Um, 
some of these uh, some of these uh, groups in the collaborative are are very widely encompassing groups like the Russian River Watershed Association, which includes like the town of Windsor and Healdsburg, and they, they help run their own they run sites for those those cities. And we do have a member of uh, the Household Hazardous Waste Team is also part of the Russian River Watershed Association, so they come to our meetings as well. And so through the Russian River Watershed Association, many of the, the groups that you, you've, you brought up are, are in that, and I, I apologize for not expanding on who's a, who's a part of that more. But the solid waste haulers, are they at the table in any of these groups? Um, they're represented by the household hazardous waste groups and also the Department of Health is carrying on and continuing dialogue with the um, the sorters and at Recology and whatnot and Republic um, because of the, the sharp issues that happen at Recology and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other qu comments or questions? Thank you very much, Mr. St. George. Appreciate it. We have no consent items, no report items, any public comments on non-agenda matters? Seeing no one rise, we have no referrals or written communications. Any subcommittee reports? Hearing none, any board member reports? I know board member Dowd had something I think he wanted to bring up, so maybe we'll pass on the board member reports for a moment. And I'll turn the meeting over to our assistant city attorney for some comments on her recent aqua attendance. Thanks, Chair Galvin. Um, I, I wasn't the only staff person that was um, um, fortunate enough to attend the Aqua Conference. That's the Association of Clean Water Agencies, um, our California um, organization that we were a member of last week. Um, Deputy Director Burke, as well as um, Colin Close and uh, Nicole Dorotinsky um, from the Water Department were also in attendance. I'm just, I'll touch on a couple of the highlights that I um, noted at the um, conference. Um, SB 998 was passed recently. Um, that's a, a legislation that was carried by Dab, Dodd, sorry, um, Senator Dodd, and it deals with a um, local agency's ability to shut off water service for delinquency. Um, it extends the time in which um, a user has to be delinquent in their payment to 60 days before shutoff can occur. Um, it requires us to have procedures in place, um, and it also um, limits the amount of uh, fees that we can charge to restart um, water service, um, to base 50 or 150, depending on whether it's during business hours or not. Um, and then it also has some limits based on income level and health, um, so exceptions to whether um, the uh, um, city would be able to um, discontinue water. So those are things that we're gonna be looking at. There's a, about, I think, a, I think it becomes effective at the beginning of 21, uh, or 2020, sorry. And um, it's possible that there could be some legal challenges um, based on unfunded mandate from the state as well as potentially Proposition 218. Um, as you are probably aware, the city has the H2O program, help to others, um, and fortunately we would, might be able to have some diversion into that program if we have issues, um, but we'll be looking at that and it's uh, another requirement that um, water agencies statewide are gonna have to navigate. Um, there's also possible state legislation um, that Aqua is sponsoring that would create a trust fund and also mechanisms to um, increase monies into the trust fund that would um, be could be utilized in a statewide program that would provide assistance for water users who had um, difficulty or income eligibility for um, to, to pay water bills. So there's um, an issue there as far as um, looking at ability to pay and how to alleviate the um, where the cost where there may be a need. Um, 
I think you may have heard of the water tax, which was a proposal to put um, a fee basically on everybody's water bill that has not been carried yet um, forward, but it's still out there and being discussed. And um, as a way to fund development in um, disadvantaged communities for safe, clean drinking water. Um, everybody wants there to be safe, clean drinking water in these communities, but the, the difficulty and the question and discussion I think is, um, how should that be paid for and who should carry the cost of that? So that's an ongoing discussion at Aqua. Um, in the GSA, Groundwater Sustainability Agency category, there recently have been some um, requests for basin boundary amendments in conjunction with some potential reprioritizations that could um, increase the number of um, basins that need to comply with um, the GSA requirements and have a, a, a GSA and then a G, uh, groundwater sustainability plan in place by 2022. So that's ongoing. Um, there have been recent water conservation rules. I know that Deputy Director Burke has briefed you on. Um, there's a lot of rulemaking going on in the implementation of that that um, the city and um, our water folks are involved in. Um, on the legal front, there was a case um, called Wild versus City of Dunsmer, which is a Proposition 218 case, and the question is whether um, the a, a, an ordinance setting fees or water rates um, can be repealed. So basically an ordinance setting water rates can be repealed um, by referendum. Um, we know that the, the initiative process can be used, um, but there hasn't been a question yet uh, or final decision about whether a referendum could repeal um, the correct, the appropriate adoption of rates. So um, Aqua's looking at, the legal committee's looking at participating in um, requests for depublication, potentially um, amicus brief also, if it uh, goes up on rehearing or appeal, so. Thank you for that update. Uh, we'll go back now to item number 12, board member reports. Board member Dowd. Yes, uh, my report comes from an ex parte meeting that uh, I was asked to attend by, uh, I believe their official name now is Recycle Sonoma. It was Will Bax and uh, Dennis Rosati. And it was about uh, them having been selected by, the, I believe it's proper Sonoma County Waste Management Agency. Uh, and it was regarding the proposed compost facility that was going to be uh, created on the north side of the Laguna treatment plant. Long story short, um, there seems to be a, a lot of balls up in the air over that and what my request is in this report is I would like to have staff and consultants and possibly outside agents like Recycle Sonoma uh, prepare a presentation to the BPU uh, on what the status is, where we're going, what decisions are in play, et cetera, et cetera, because um, it seems to me there's a great deal of uh, confusion and changing going on. Uh, that's my request, Chairman. Thank you. Um, the way we handle this typically, since it's a request from one of the board members, if I can get a second on that, we'll put it on the next agenda for a formal vote and then uh, move forward if we're in concurrence with uh, the staff presentation. A second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, so I'll direct staff then to make sure that that becomes an agenda item at our next meeting. Anything further from the board members? Then we'll move to the director's report, acting director Cervoni. Thank you, Chair Galvin. As a follow-up to a previous email, I wanted to inform the board that Deputy Director Emma Walton and Deputy Director Jennifer Burke will be sharing the role as interim water department director over the next six to seven months while the recruitment for a permanent director is being conducted. <laughs> Deputy Director Walton will be the interim director from Monday, December 10th through March 3rd, and Deputy Director Burke will be the interim director March 4th through May 12th. 
Um, we have some good news on the refinancing of the water 2008 series bonds and the 2007A wastewater bonds. Um, the original estimated net savings were about $1.2 million for the water bonds and about $847,000 for the wastewater bonds. After entering the market, net savings will fall around $1.6 million for water and $1.8 million for wastewater. So the wastewater refinancing more than doubled the estimate, estimation, so now both will provide over $100,000 annual savings. I also wanted to notify the board that this meeting will be the last board meeting for Deputy Director Rita Miller. Uh, Rita will be retiring from her position as the Deputy Director of Environmental Services on December 27th. We are very excited for Rita and wish her all the best in this new chapter of her life. And Rita will be sorely missed by Santa Rosa Water and the entire city of Santa Rosa. Rita has worked for the city for over 12 years and has demonstrated her commitment to the city and to our environment in so many ways. And many Santa Rosa Water and Transportation Public Works employees had the benefit of working with Rita in multiple activations of the Department Operations Center during the October 2017 wildfires. Rita also worked on the watershed task force, showing her unwavering commitment to our environment by making sure any of the contaminants produced by the wildfire were not impacting our creeks and streams. So Rita, we like to thank you for your service and commitment to this organization, and we wish you all the best. Any questions for the director, acting director, Board Member Grable? Uh, will there be a formal meeting and, and ceremony for uh, Deputy Director Miller? Is it, it you, did you say this was the last meeting? Th this will be a Deputy Director Miller's last um, BPU meeting, that's correct. Okay. Where's the, where's the cake and the fireworks at? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would like to say thank you as well. As someone who got to see uh, Deputy Director Miller in, in action at the Watershed Task Force and just very difficult circumstances and, and her leadership, I mean, was was really an inspiration to myself and many others I know um, who were looking to her for a lot of expertise and guidance in, in what were pretty tough, fast-moving times. And I, yeah, I cannot... I can't give, give enough praise or, or gratitude to, to her for that um, leadership, to especially to me personally and, and others I know who are in those cold, noisy army tents, um, and of course in, in the rest of her work and career, just amazing, amazing service, so thank you so much. I would echo that, Rita, and uh, we wish you all the best in your retirement. I hope you'll come back and see us, and I'm sure you'll stay in touch with the water department staff, and, and uh, it's going to be tough to fill your shoes, so much good luck to you. So our next book, yes, I'll go right ahead. Absolutely. Pardon me for being unconventional, but since this is my last meeting, I thought you'd forgive me. <laughs> um, I really appreciate um, acting director's comments, and I would like to just take an opportunity to really thank the BPU for your amazing service to our community. You support Santa Rosa Water for being such an outstanding uh, leader in our industry, and you have supported our ability to provide safe, clean drinking water to our community, to provide reliable sanitation services, all the while also promoting beneficial environmental protective actions um, aligned with our operations. So I wanted to thank you for your service, the volunteer position, and you come every meeting well prepared and dedicated to help guide us in our um, activities. So I also wanted to take an opportunity to thank all of my colleagues. Um, it's been 
a deep honor and pleasure to work in this position and to work for the city of Santa Rosa over the years. And please don't worry about my leaving. There are a number of really excellent candidates who are probably ready to step into my position. And um, I think you will be well served by the next deputy director. Um, I'd also really like to thank our community and our ratepayers who are very informed. They're very environmentally um, uh, I guess inclined, so they've really helped me in my job working with regulators, NGOs, interested stakeholders, and staff in the city have just really made my job an honor and a true privilege. So it is with mixed feelings that I leave my position, but I will long remember and feel very grateful for the time that I've spent in this department. So thank you very much. Thank you. So our next meeting, I believe, is on January 17th of next year. Is that correct, Gina? So I'd like to wish you all happy holidays. We'll see you in the new year, and I think we will adjourn this meeting in honor of Deputy Director Rita Miller. We're adjourned.